<clears throat> now my subject matter for tonight from Leviticus 18 is not going to be obvious just from reading the chapter, but I'm actually going to be preaching on profanity. Now I'm not referring to the profanity that we think of today. When you hear the word profanity, you think of people using bad words, right? I mean, normally you say, oh, no profanity, it means no swearing or cussing or whatever. But actually, when we're looking at, when I'm talking about profanity, I'm talking about profanity in the Bible and it's more to do with the use of the word profane. Things that are profane, that's profanity. I mean, that's literally what it is. So when we're talking about profanity in the Bible, it really doesn't have anything to do with the words that you use. Now, just a brief comment as we're getting into this, because I'm not going to talk about this anymore for the rest of the sermon. The profanity that people use these days, you know, that we think of profanity... I don't think, you know, I don't use that type of language. I don't think it's good language to use. The Bible has some scripture that talks about, you know, to, to watch basically the things that you say and, um, and not to, you know, the way that we ought to use our language. Um, over in general, you know, words are words. They all have meaning. But if someone uses a, you know, a certain four letter words, I don't even necessarily think they're sinful. But what it does is it just shows you your ignorance. Maybe it shows, you know, you're using a dumbed-down language. You're using a language that, that, that shows zero intelligence behind what you're saying. Maybe a little bit of passion, but you can get the same exact point across without having to use those words that many consider to be vulgar, and many of them are vulgar. You know, so I'm not endorsing of it or anything, but this is not what this sermon is about. When we're talking about profanity, in Leviticus 18 here, we're going to see this first mention of the use of, of profane. Now, in all of Leviticus 18, almost all of it, we see this, this huge section of Leviticus 18 is talking about sexual immorality. It's talking about lying with, you know, with, with people who are near of kin to you. It's, when it says uncover their nakedness. It's, it's not literally talking about going and like lifting up someone's skirt. You know, like that's not what it means. It, it means lying down with them and having a, an adult relation with them that's, that's not acceptable in God's eyes because they are, you know, whether it's your aunt or your, you know, your, your father's daughter, you know, maybe you have a stepdad or something, you know, it's a, these, these, all these ways, it lays all this stuff out. It's all this immorality that has to do with going to bed with people. And we see here in verse 20, it says, Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech. Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. Now, as we go through, I just want you to keep this in, in mind. When we, when we look at that word profane in the Bible, it's, it's almost always associated with profaning God's name. And what we need to realize as a Christian, you are here representing Jesus Christ. You are here representing God. You are, if you're known as a Christian, you, know, you are profaning God's name when you get into sin. It literally is. It's, and, and what does the word profane mean? It's, it's really just you're despising it. You're, you're dragging it down. You know, God's name is a name that should be exalted. When his name is profaned, what you're doing is, is you're dirtying it. You're muddying it. You're, you're, you're kind of bringing it down from its exalted place. Now, when, and I think that's the reason why people use the word profane for, for words, you know, profanity, is that you're, you're kind of treating people with disrespect when you use language like that you're 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 profaning them by by using you know i'm pretty sure that's where the word profanity comes from is in that sense of the word but again that's that's the last i'm going to mention that sense because in the bible when we see the word profane it's mostly talking about you know god's name being profaned as a result of sin so he's saying here when you pass your 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 children your seed Unto, unto this false god of Molech, when you're offering up a, a human sacrifice, literally, he says, you're profaning the name of God. Flip over to, to Leviticus chapter 19. Verse number 5, Leviticus 19. The Bible reads, And if ye offer a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord, ye shall offer it at your own will. It shall be eaten the same day ye offer it, and on the morrow, and if aught remain until the third day, it shall be burnt in the fire. And if it be eaten at all on the third day, it is abominable. It shall not be accepted. So he's here he's talking about this. It's a free will sacrifice of peace offerings. It's a peace offering for God. You say, I want to make peace with God, right? I want to, I want to make things right. It's not a sin offering. 
It's not the, you know, the other offerings that the Bible talks about. This is just a peace offering. The peace offerings were given. It's not a commandment that you have to do it. So he's saying, okay, this is of your own free will. But he has rules for it. Just because you're giving something to God of your own free will, he still has rules that he expects you to follow. He says, okay, here are the rules when you want to give a peace offering. It's your own will. You decide to do it. If you want to do it, great. If you don't want to do it, fine. It's up to you. But if you're going to do it, this is the way you're going to do it. He says, you can offer it. You can eat of it the first day, the second day. But when, if you still have some of that offering left over, because what is an offering? It's, a, it's an animal sacrifice. right? They offer up these animals as a sacrifice, but then they partake in eating of it, of eating the meat that comes as a result of the burnt offering. They cook the meat. And then, and then they eat it, you know, usually eat it with the Levites and, and the, the poor and the widows and things like that. And they eat these offerings and then they go back home after they make their offerings. And he's saying, okay, well, obviously, you know, you kill an animal, you bring a bullock or something, that could be a lot of food for a while. So, you know, okay, you eat the first day, you eat the second day, but whatever's left over on that third day, you can't eat any of that. Like, it's done. You're, you're done with it. That's the end of the sacrifice. You know, it's not going to be accepted. If you you continue to eat on the third day, verse number eight says, therefore, everyone that eateth it shall bear his iniquity. And this is really bad. I mean, you start off saying, hey, I want to make a peace offering to God. You know, it's my own free will. I'm going to do this. what I want to do. But then he's saying, if you continue, it's going to be sin unto you because you're not obeying God. It says, because he hath profaned the hallowed thing of the Lord. And that soul shall be cut off from among his people. This is serious punishment saying of not keeping the hallowed things of God, the things that God separates and makes holy and, 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 he, and he designs a specific way of doing it. When you go against that, it's actually abominable. He calls that, abom- he says, and if it be eaten at all on the third day, it is abominable. It's much hated by God when you do things like that because you're just completely disregarding what he wants you to do. And oftentimes today we have people that they want to serve God. They want to, they want to freely offer themselves and they want to do these great things for God, but they don't do it in a way that God has specified he wants it to be done. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about animal sacrifices. We know we don't do that anymore. But oftentimes people just want to bring their best and do everything their way and say, well, God looks at my heart anyway, so let's just find God doesn't care. No, he does care. God pays attention to detail. He gives us specific instructions and he wants us to obey way more than he wants whatever comes into your heart to give to him. It needs to be done in the way that he has specified. He tells us, and the Bible tells us exactly how he wants things done. If we're going to do something for him, he tells us how to do it. When we don't do things his way, we profane the name of the Lord. We're basically saying, well, we don't care, and we, and we, we, we uh, bring down the holy name of God. Flip over, if you would, to Leviticus 21. You're in chapter 19. Let's look at chapter 21. We're going to see some more profaning. So we saw the profaning when, uh, when people were giving their, their children as a human sacrifice unto Molech. Which is, I mean, that's extremely bad. That's, that's pretty obvious, right? To say, okay, you're, you're, you're offering up your children as a sacrifice unto a false god. Yeah, that's going to profane the name of the Lord. That's a no-brainer, right? But then we see here, okay, so people are bringing just this, this offering, that they want to do. It's not something they even have to do. It's not because they sin. They just want to do this. And God's saying, okay, if you don't do it the way that I'm telling you, and, you, and if you just decide you want to eat of that food another extra day, he says that you are now profaning the name of the Lord. And profanity, you know, this profaning is, is a strong word. It, it is one that's, that's you're, you're corrupting God's name. You're, 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 you're bringing it down. Leviticus 21, look at verse number 5. We're going to see some more profaning of God's name. In verse number 5, the Bible reads, They shall not make baldness upon their head. This is talking about the priests. Neither shall they shave off the corner of their beard, nor make any cuttings in their flesh. They shall be holy unto their God, and not profane the name, the name of their God. For the offerings of the Lord made by fire, and the bread of their God they do offer... Therefore, they shall be holy. So what he's trying to say here is he's explaining that the priests need to have this certain appearance and they need to do these things. He says, I don't want their heads to be bald and I don't want them shaving off the corners of their beards or making cuttings in their flesh. They're the priests. They are offering things that are holy unto God. So they need to be holy. They are representative of God and they can't profane the name of God by going against and doing these things that they want to do when God said no. Let's keep reading here. Verse number seven. 
They shall not take a wife that is a whore or profane. Neither shall they take a woman put away from her husband, for he is holy unto his God. So he's given some more rules for the priests. He's saying, you know, if there's a, a, a woman that's a whore, that is not allowed for the priest to marry someone that was a whore. I mean, you can say, well, she used to be. Well, it doesn't matter. In order for them to be holy and do the work of God, he says, you cannot be joining yourself unto a woman that's a whore. And he says, or profane, and not someone who's divorced. You know, a woman that's put away from their husband. He says, no, you can't. That's not a wife for you. If you're a priest, that is not, that is not an option for you to do that because he's trying to set this standard. I mean, just like today, the, the, the pastors are set to a specific standard as well. Just to you, know, you, you read um, in the Bible it talks about the qualifications for a pastor, married to one wife, right? A pastor also shouldn't be marrying someone who's been put away, who's divorced. But let's keep reading here. Verse number 8. Thou shalt sanctify him therefore, for he offereth the bread of thy God. He shall be holy unto thee, for I the Lord which sanctify you am holy. And her daughter, excuse me, and the daughter of any priest. Look at this. If she profane herself by playing the whore, she profaneth her father. She shall be burnt with fire. That's a strong judgment to come down. But it's because this is the, the priest is an important role. He is doing, you know, he is to be, you know, a holy man of God, being used by God to perform these sacrifices and to have this position. And now they're saying, well, look, if, if that priest has a daughter that goes around and plays the whore and, and commits all this fornication and complete rebellion to her priest father, well, now she's profaning the name of her father. And this gives us a likeness of, of that word profane, that she is, you know, the daughter is representative of her father the same way that we are representative of our heavenly father. So when we're rebellious and we just go around and do these things, you know, you may think, well, that's just affecting me and my name. You know, I might just be bringing a bad name upon myself if I get caught, you know, drinking or smoking or doing drugs or, or you know, fornicating or whatever. According to what we're seeing in the Bible here, that's not true. You're not just in, you know, impacting yourself in your own name. You're actually profaning the name of God. You're bringing an evil report on God's name. And, and it's going to cause people to, to bring a bad report on, Christi on, on Christianity overall. Because they're going to look at you and judge Christianity by the way that you act. Now, I'm not saying it's right for them to do that, but that's what happens. And you end up profaning the name of God. And here we see a very severe punishment for someone, you know, for a priest's daughter. And I mean, a daughter of a priest should know better. Going around and playing the whore, it says she's going to be burnt with fire. That's what the Bible says. And that's, you know, God's word is holy and true. And he says, if he says it, then that's the way that it ought to be. She profaneth her father. She shall be burnt with fire. Turn, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 23. Most of the profanity that we're going to see here is propagated by pastors. And it comes from the supposed men of God. I mean, we already started to see, you know, the, the, the priests that were supposed to be holy, that were profaning God's name. If they were, you know, to have baldness on their head or if they're not doing things the way that God told them to do, if they shave off the corners of their beard, make any cuttings in their flesh, they're profaning God's name. As a... As a uh, a servant of the Lord. But look at Jeremiah chapter 23 in verse number 1. Jeremiah 23 verse number 1. The Bible reads, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. Now, we're going to jump down in a minute to later on. But I want to preface this because we're going to deal a lot with pastors for a little while and priests and men of God or prophets, preachers. Because you say, well, I'm not a preacher, so what does this matter? Well, yeah, but you listen to preachers. 
And the big problem is that there's a lot of pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep and they don't go hard on sin and they go soft on it and they basically are causing people in the congregation to sin. And you need to be aware of that because you are going to be judged for your own sins. And you can't hold somebody else responsible of saying, well, he never told me or he said this was okay. That's not a valid excuse. You need to read the Bible on your own. But he's saying, woe be to the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep. Look at verse number 9. Mine heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man and like a man whom wine hath overcome because of the Lord and because of the words of his holiness. Look at this, verse 10. For the land is full of adulterers. Does that sound familiar? It sounds like the day we're living in today. The land is full of adulterers. Why? Because men of God, the pastors, aren't standing up and saying, Hey, adultery is worthy of the death penalty according to God. It's a wicked sin. It's not just an affair. This is a big deal. and You need to guard yourself against it. And you need to be doing every precaution to make sure that you are not spending time about, with, the, with the opposite gender and getting to know each other and, and drawing you and tempting you away from your spouse. It needs to be very, very um, given much diligence and attention to. Your marriage is extremely important. And adultery is a major sin. A major sin. And when the pastors are destroying and scattering the sheep, the prophets, the land becomes full of adulterers. Because it's not being thundered out from the pulpit as it ought to be to, to rattle in your mind throughout the week and throughout your life saying, you know what, no, I, you know, I am not going to give in to this temptation because this is severe. This is serious. For the land is full of adulterers, verse 10, for because of swearing, the land mourneth. The pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up and their course is evil and their force is not right. For both prophets and priests are profane. Yea, in my house have I found their wickedness, saith the Lord. He's saying, you know, these supposed men of God, they're profane. They're not living holy. They're not doing what's right. He says, I found their wickedness in my house. Their wickedness is going on in the church. Verse 12, wherefore their way shall be unto them as slippery ways in the darkness. You know, that's a pretty good adjective to describe these, these phony pastors and, 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 and priests that are profane. They're real slippery, right? Their ways are slippery. They're subtle. They're like snakes that, that, that won't preach the truth from God's word and that just want to say everything's okay and that, and that you know, sin isn't that big of a deal. It says, they shall be driven on and fall therein, for I will bring evil upon them, even the year of their visitation, saith the Lord. Verse 13, and I have seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied in Baal and caused my people Israel to err. So he's, he's, he's putting this blame on these prophets saying they're causing my people to, to err, to be an error, to do things that are wrong. And again, why is that important for you? Because you need to make sure you're not being led astray by people. You know, you might be listening to people online or, or reading books or whatever from, from people that are claiming to be men of God and that want to teach. Watch out for these false prophets as they prophesied in Baal and they're causing the people to err. Verse 14, I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. There's that reference to adultery again. And remember, we had the same similar types of sin going on in Leviticus 18 where we started off reading. They commit adultery and walk in lies. This is talking about the prophets too, by the way. Verse 14, I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem an horrible thing. They commit adultery. The very prophets who are supposed to be preaching God's word are the ones involved in, in adultery. And walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers that none doth return from his wickedness. The job of the prophet is supposed to expose the deeds of the evildoers, not to help them and encourage them. And when you hear people just, you know, not preaching on sin, what are you doing? You're encouraging it. When you hear people talking about their sins and 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 you know, going on and on, and you don't say anything about it, you're encouraging it. This is the one of the reasons, you know, this, is, this isn't exactly the same as with the sins, but like, you know, when you, when you keep silent, it's agreement. 
And when we were out soul winning this afternoon, you know, there was this lady who was saying that, well, I just think that hell's not a, you know, it's just being separated from God, and that's toward, you know, that's bad enough in itself. Just not being with God is really bad. And you know, I couldn't just stay silent for the whole time that she was talking about that because it's important. It's a really important thing, and just to sit there and be like, oh yeah, okay. No, I had to make it clear, you know, no, actually the Bible talks about hell quite a bit. It's a real place, you know, and this is, you know, that's obviously why we're out there doing this anyways, because we're worried about people going to hell, as Brother Sebastian had mentioned too after we brought that up. But um, when you're silent, you're, it's like you're in agreement. And what happens oftentimes in, in, these, in, in many churches is that, you know, pastors may become aware of sins in the congregation and things that are going on, but they're afraid to say anything about it. Maybe they don't want to offend their congregation or the word that they might leave and go somewhere else because they'll feel like you're picking on them. Look, that's not your job is just to worry about what they might do. Your job is to expose the wickedness instead of strengthening the hands of the evildoers to do even more. As a pastor, I've, I've already experienced this. You know, oftentimes people want to go and bring a question to the pastor. Right? They want to ask you something because something's going on in their life. And they want to know, hey, what would you do in this situation? Hey, what should I do here? And 99% of the time, the people already know what the right answer is. But they're thinking that maybe you'll say something different. And they want that kind of... The, they either want the affirmation that what they're doing is right, which, which happens sometimes. Or they're trying to think of a way that, like, well, maybe he'll say this isn't that bad and it's okay. And the, in a way to try to justify their sin that they already know is wrong. But they want to try to feel, well, what do you think? Is this okay? Let me explain all the details. You don't have to explain the details. It's wrong. <laughs> I mean, most of the time, when you're asking me a question, is this right or wrong? The safe answer is it's wrong. And that's probably the most common answer is that, yep, nope, you got it right the first time. It's wrong. You know, trying to justify your sin. But see, if you know, if I were to know something's wrong and they ask me and I just say, oh, yeah, that's not that big of a deal. I don't think God's going to care. That's me strengthening the hands to pe- for people to do wickedness and commit wickedness and do, do evil. It says, they strengthen also the hands of evildoers that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom. Another strong, this is, this is the way God views these false, these, these, these pastors and these prophets that are committing adultery and they're strengthening the hands of the evildoers. He says, they're like Sodom to me. And we know what God did to Sodom. He rained down fire and brimstone upon them. Because these guys are false prophets, and the inhabitants thereof is Gomorrah. Verse 15. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets Behold, I will feed them with wormwood and make them drink the water of gall. For from the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land. Do you see how much profanity these, these, these pastors, these false prophets, are able to spread? He says it's spreading in all the land. Because of the work of what they're doing. They're profaning the whole land. And when things get bad enough and, the, and, and, and God's name is being profaned and that people are just becoming more and more defiled, God's going to bring his judgment upon that people. Verse number 16. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. See, this is something you need to be on the lookout for. The, the prophets that prophesy that God hasn't sent. We need to be able to show that type of discernment to know what's coming from God and what isn't so that we don't listen to them because you don't want to just say, oh, sorry, God, I listened to what this guy said. He's warning you here in Jeremiah 23. Don't listen to them. Verse 17. They say still unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said, ye shall have peace. So the false prophet, to the people who despise God, like the sodomites, haters of God, right? People, the, the reprobate that hates God, what the, what's the false pop, prophet going to say? Oh, you'll have peace. Oh, God loves you. Things are just fine. It says, the Lord hath said, you shall peace. And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. Do what's right. You know what? Do whatever you feel is right. That added, that that advice is the worst advice that you can get. Whatever you feel is right. That's what the false prophet. You know. You know why it's so popular? Because people love to hear that. Oh yeah, I'm gonna do. I feel. You know, hey, what I feel is right. No, you need to do what God says is right, not what you feel is right. 
You need to compare what you feel with what the, the Word of the Lord says. That is what is right and that is what is true. Not just, you know, it would be easy for you to get up here and, and give a rah-rah session and say how great you are and how everything's going well and you got nothing to worry about. Hey, God loves you. God does God's not angry. God's not angry with the wicked every day. Come on, that's not true. That's what the false prophet says, even though it says the exact opposite in the Bible. But he's warning about these prophets that say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. Jump down to verse 22. The Bible says, But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned from them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. That's the true purpose of these prophets is to show the people to hear God's words. Not the words of, of, of the man that just wants to, to tell you a bunch of hot air of whatever he believes in his opinion. It's God's words so that they can hear God's words and not only hear, they can fear and turn from their evil way and say, you know what, I better not be doing that. You know what, I'm getting, I'm getting a little bit too friendly with, with this girl at work. I better, I better get really far away from that so that I don't have to you know, get anywhere close to adultery. So that I, I don't even have to, to, to even tiptoe up to that line. I'm going to keep myself pure and clean. That's what hearing God's word will do for you. It's going to help you to have the right mindset about sin and the evil of their doings. Look at... Um, Ezekiel. Turn if you would to Ezekiel chapter 22. It's just the next book after, well, after Lamentations. But uh, you have Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Lamentations in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 22. A little bit more about the prophets prophesying lies and deceits in the name of the Lord. Ezekiel 22. Look at verse number 25. The Bible reads. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof. Like a roaring lion ravening the prey, they have devoured souls. They have taken the treasures and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law. Look at this. They have profaned mine holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and And profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean, and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. The priest's job is to show the people look, this is right, this is clean, this is what you should be doing, this is the right way, and this is unclean, this is wrong. Don't go this way and making that very clear and showing a clear cut difference between right and wrong. But what the false prophet does is they try to blur those lines. They try to make it all great. And there, there really is no right and wrong. And it's, it's just kind of what you feel and, and, and how you do. And in so doing, they profane God. They profane the name of the Lord and, and bring it down. God's holy. God, in God, everything is right. You know, you have to do what's right. You have to follow what's right and, and stay away from that which is wrong. And that's, that's how his name is, is lifted up. But when you start muddying the waters and, and making no difference between the clean and the unclean, that's when his name gets profaned. Look at uh, chapter 44. I want to touch on the subject here, Ezekiel chapter 44, about the priests today that are failing to show the difference between something that's clean and something that's unclean. And you know, I'll tell you what it is right now before we even read this, this chapter of section. There's, there are too many you know, so-called pastors or men of God that are trying to endorse drinking alcohol and they'll say it's just fine. 
alcoholic, wine, or I don't care if it's wine, I don't care if it's beer, I don't care if it's vodka, hard liquor, I don't care what it is. The alcoholic beverage is unclean. It is not for you to consume. It is poison. It is the poison of ass and the poison of dragons. There's nothing clean about it. If you want a glass of juice, guess what? That's clean. There's no poison corrupting a good drink like that. Water, great. Yeah, that's clean. Alcoholic beverages are unclean. And we're going to see that here in Ezekiel chapter 44. Let's look at verse number 20. We're going to start off seeing some of the same rules for the priests with the, you know, with the shaving of their heads and, this, you know, and the way that they're supposed to present themselves in order for them to be holy and not profane the name of God. Look at verse 20. Neither shall they shave their heads nor suffer their locks to grow long. They shall only pull their heads. They're saying don't shave it all the way down to where there's no hair and don't let it grow real long. Look, as a man of God, as a priest, you just need to have a, a, just a normal short man's haircut. Pull it. Verse 21. Look at this. Neither shall any priest drink wine when they enter into the court. Neither shall they take for their wives a widow, nor her that is put away, but they shall take maidens of the seed of the house of Israel. Or a widow that had a priest before. So we're seeing a lot of the same things here. Now he added that, look, don't drink wine when you go into the to the inner court. Why? Because it's holy. Why can't you drink wine? If there's nothing wrong with drinking wine, then why can't you drink it when you go into the inner court? Because it's not clean. And the priest needs to be clean in order to go into that inner court, the holiest of holies. When you go into that place, when you go into the house of God, because this is what they were dealing with, when you go into a place that it needs to be holy and they had special garments and things they had to wear and, and rules they had to follow in order to go in God's house, hey, everything had to be holy and pure. Wine, what, if, hey, if wine's pure, hey, it's not a big deal. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not unclean. Then why was it not? Why is it specifically mentioned you cannot have a drink of wine if you're going to go into that place because that place is holy? Why? Because this is talking about an alcoholic beverage that you cannot have when you go into the house of God because wine, the alcoholic wine that we know today is an unclean beverage. It's fermented. I mean, think about the leaven in the Bible with, with bread is always symbolic of sin. Always. And what is alcohol in the, in the wine? It's, it's the, the fermentation process that is basically a leaven. It's a yeast. It's a bacteria that grows that, that is the, in the process that creates the alcohol in there. It's, uncle- it's impurity. It's uncleanness. And that's what happens. And, um, you know, the priest of all people is supposed to be the one that can show the people the difference between unclean and clean. And this is what God is trying to do of saying, look, you cannot profane my name. Don't profane my temple. Don't profane the things of God by bringing things in that aren't clean, by doing things in a way that I told you not to do. When you bring in the wine, you're making it profane. You're profaning the name of the Lord. Verse 23 says, And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and profane and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. All of these things that were mentioned in those few verses with their, with their heads, you know, being pulled and not being long and not being too short and not drinking wine and their wives not taking a widow, you know, all these things. It's for them to be clean. It's to show a purity in that man in the position that he has serving God. Because they need to be clean. They need to be holy. They need to be separated and sanctified unto the Lord to do the work that they're doing. The alcohol, when you bring in the wine, it's, it's unclean. Turn, if you would, to Amos chapter 2. Amos chapter 2. We're almost done. It's going to be a little bit of a shorter sermon tonight. Amos chapter 2. Verse number 6, the Bible reads, Thus saith the Lord, For three transgressions of Israel, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they sold the righteous for silver, and the poor for a pair of shoes, that pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor, and turn aside the way of the meek. And a man and his father will go in unto the same maid 
to profane my holy name. This is talking about people, look, the transgression of Israel is getting pretty bad when, when they sell the righteous for silver. People who are actually doing what's right, they just sell them. You know, they don't care about it. They, the, the poor, you know, the defenseless, they, they, they'll sell the poor too. They'll sell them to slavery or whatever. That, um, it says that pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor. Just, just trampling the poor people. And it says, you know, and turning aside the way of the meek. These are all good attributes of being, being meek. And, and, and the poor people, you know, God has a special place for them in his heart. And he's saying, you know, they don't care about the poor. They don't care about the meek. They don't care about the righteous. They have nothing to do with them. They'll, they'll push them down. They'll trot on their head. And it says, even a man and his father will go in under the same maid. A man and his father both having the same woman. What kind of wick, bizarre wickedness is that? I mean, you don't even hear about that stuff, but look, he says, this profanes my holy name. Look at verse number eight. And they lay themselves down upon clothes laid to pledge by every altar, and they drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. The wine of the condemned. Now, why does it say the wine of the condemned? Sounds to me like it's mentioning a specific type of wine. Not just any wine, but the wine of the condemned. I wonder what type of wine that's talking about. And I did an entire sermon about this. I'm not going to reprove the point. There is so it, it baffles me that there are people who will listen to somebody call themselves a pastor that says when a, when the Bible talks about wine, it's talking about an alcoholic drink every single time. I have a sermon called Their Wine Versus Our Wine, where the Bible lists off, you know, the people that drink of the vine of Sodom versus the positive references to wine. It's clear it's talking about two different drinks. How can the Bible say, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it gave it this color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright, and then say, hey, drink some wine, it's great. And Jesus is turning water into wine. And that it's all just the same beverage. And the Bible says, you know, wine is a mocker, yet Jesus is making wine. And somehow it's all just the same thing. And this is saying the wine of the condemned. What is the, what do you think is the wine? It doesn't take a, a theologian or a Bible scholar or a Greek expert to understand what the wine of the condemned is. It's obvious. It's talking about alcohol. It's the wine of the condemned. Just like the vine of Sodom. We ought to have nothing to do with that. Though. It's cle- you know, Again, I- I'm not going through, I don't have all the references down here. I've done it in the past. I have an entire sermon about it. But there are pastors today, there are preachers that are going to preach and say, nothing wrong with alcohol. And they're profaning the name of the Lord. And they are not showing the difference between clean and unclean as they ought to be doing. Last place we'll turn, turn to Malachi chapter 1. Malachi. Last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 1. We're going to start reading in verse 11. The Bible reads, For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. God wants his name to be exalted. God wants people listening to his words and lifting up the name of the Lord. Look at verse number 12. He says, but ye have profaned it. So my name is going to be great among the Gentiles, among the heathen. It's going to be great, but you've profaned my name. In that ye say, the table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even as meat, is contemptible. Ye said also, Behold, what a weariness is it. And ye have snuffed that, it saith the Lord of hosts. And ye brought that which was torn, and the lame, and the sick. Thus ye brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver which hath in his flock a male, and voweth and sacrifices unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. So what's he saying here? They profane the name of the Lord in their offerings. In a verse 8, because what were they doing? Instead of bringing their best unto God, which is what he demanded in, in, uh, you know, in their offerings, that you know, the offerings need to be without spot and without blemish and everything else, 
Well, they started to bring in their lame, their sick, the wor- they're basically the worst of their flock. Well, I need to offer, I, I, I need to bring in my tithe. I need I need to do something for God. So I guess I'll just let's see. Yeah, that one looks like it's ready to die anyways. Let's give that one to God. And they're profaning the name of God because they're just thinking about themselves and their wealth and everything else. And they don't care about God. They don't care about offering a sacrifice. They're just doing it because they feel obligated to do it, apparently. And that they're just giving him his worst. Their worst. And that profanes the name of God. Now, how would I liken this today? Well, what do you give to God? I mean, these, these are offerings that they're offering up to God. But it's not their best. They're offering up their worst. Do you just give your leftovers to God? I mean, what, what are the things that you give to God? You give God your time. How much time do you spend with God? Is it just, well, I've got all these other things to do. And then at the end of the day, if I have enough time, maybe I'll open up my Bible and read. Is that what you're offering up to God? Well, I've got all this other stuff to do. Maybe, just maybe, I'll say one prayer. Maybe, maybe I'll, I'll if I have enough time, I'll, I'll make it to church this week. I don't know. Does that sound like an acceptable sacrifice unto God of, of what you have? You think that's going to be pleasing unto him? That you put him so low and you brought his holy name down to the level of just like, well, if I get around to it. They were profaning the name of the Lord when they were giving God their worst. And I believe we do this very same thing, profaning the name of God when you lower the priority of him in your life. When you just bring down that name. And just, you know, well, I've got my family, I've got, I've got my work, I've got all these other things going on. And then, you know what, yeah, I've got, I got yard work to do. And then, um, well, there's a TV show I really want to watch. After that, I'll read my Bible. We ought not to give God our leftovers or our worst. That profanes His name. There's a lot of things that profane his name. Obviously, we need to watch out for the... the you know, and, and in most of the references, there's other references of profaning God's name. A lot of them are relatively redundant. But we've noticed a lot of them that I noticed when, when kind of looking up the, the, the usages of the word and, and how people can profane God's name, it, it oftentimes has to do with the pastors profaning the name of God because they're in that position to where they're supposed to be kept to a high standard. And they're representing the, you know, the Lord. In a sense, they're, they're here to... To do the work of God and are profaning God's name by not doing things the way that he said. And especially when the pastor is not able to distinguish between the clean and unclean and be able to say, thus saith the Lord, and this is a sin, and this is not a sin, and make it very, very clear of the people that you're supposed to be watching over and protecting from the evil of this world. So keep that in mind when you, when you hear teachers and they start saying everything's okay and there's not a problem in there and you never hear them mention sin like one time. That's a, that is a very big red flag that they're just probably some false prophet. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the warnings that you've given us. We thank you. I thank you, dear Lord, for the, for the men of God that, that do the, tell the difference between the clean and the unclean, dear Lord, and that, that, will, that aren't afraid to, to call it out and to expose um, the, the sin that's out there, dear Lord, especially when it comes to alcohol. There's something that's so easily discerned, dear Lord, and it's just seemingly so easily discerned. Even before I was saved, I knew that drinking alcohol wasn't a good thing, dear God. But Lord, help us when the pastors and, and teachers are coming up and saying, oh yeah, there's nothing wrong with it, dear Lord. There's nothing wrong with ingesting poison that impacts our brain function and, and the judgment that we use, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to, to remain vigilant and strong and not to be um, deceived by, by the deceivers that are out there preaching um, that... Uh, that the sin is not as bad as it is as it really is dear lord in jesus name we pray amen